Hello, my name is Christina Chang and I'm a fellow at ARPA-E. Today I'll be presenting on the grand challenge of making iron and steel more efficiently. First, I'll identify the three processes that consume the most energy in the existing supply chain from iron ore to steel product. Next, I'll frame where new concepts, your ideas, might pave the way forward. Technologies in this space might fall roughly into two buckets. First, could new technologies make the existing supply chain cleaner? For example, could low carbon chemistries drop into existing iron making blast furnaces? Or second, can we reinvent the supply chain entirely, creating low carbon or low energy steel manufacturing techniques whose steels meet or exceed the design specifications of state of the art steels? If you're excited to innovate in this space, we'd love to hear from you. My colleague, Dr. Zach Fang and I have left our emails on the final slide. Please connect with us and thank you for joining. Can we drive emissions from the iron and steel industry down to zero? How does this rock, iron ore, become a tin-coated steel soup can? Today, we'll journey together from rock to can, exploring major energy and emissions reduction opportunities we see in today's steel industry. And this journey consumes a lot of energy. Globally, 7% of energy use and emissions are due to steel production. Among all materials we make, steel is roughly tied with cement as the biggest CO2 emission source, and by some estimates, steel is number one. The U.S. steel industry is a moderate emitter. 2% of U.S. primary energy use and 4% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are due to domestic steel production. Moreover, for every ton of steel we produce domestically, we import another half ton, whose emissions were released somewhere else and aren't captured by these values. What processes create these large values? Let's start our journey. Then the first stage is iron making. The ore is combined with coke and other components into a blast furnace, making iron metal. This blast furnace iron making stage accounts for about 3% of world energy use, and that's the stark reality of iron making. Once we've made crude iron, it gets refined into steel. The hot steel is then poured to make rough intermediate castings, which are processed into products thermomechanically via various steps, the most energy intensive of which is rolling to make the steel thinner. Finally, stock steel products from bars to pipes to sheets leave the steel mill gates. Cast steel rolling is the second step that's very energy intensive, accounting for 1% of world energy and 1% of world greenhouse gas emissions. Last, stock steel is cut, bent, milled, and otherwise transformed into products in the energy and carbon intensive processes collectively known as fabrication, Bonus points if you recognize my old school superhero, Hephaestus. Fabrication represents a large amount of energy and emissions. The takeaway of this slide is that there are three main energy hogging steps in the journey from ore to can, iron making, hot rolling, and fabrication. Recalling that steel represents 7% of the world's energy use, we see that just these three steps represent the majority, about three, one, and 2% respectively. The CO2 numbers for these steps are also high. These percentages aren't quite as large for the US because here we only make one third of our steel using the blast furnace route and two thirds via recycling in electric arc furnaces, a lower energy and lower CO2 process not shown here. But given our current recycling technologies and demand, we still do need to make iron in the first place. So innovation in any of these three steps could be very impactful. To focus on just these three steps, I'll simplify our process diagram. And let's investigate iron making first. This happens in blast furnaces, and they mean it when they say blast. Forced air and reducing gases come in at high pressure from the bottom at greater than 2000 C, suspending these iron and coke particles as they are layered in from the top. This coke is made by heating coal in the absence of air, so it's essentially pure carbon. In the blast furnace, the coke is gasified to carbon monoxide, which in a redox process reduces the iron ore to molten crude iron, which is tapped out of the bottom. A large amount of CO2 is produced, not only because coke is combusted to increase the reaction's temperature, but also because CO2 is the byproduct of this redox reaction. In US blast furnaces, this step requires upwards of 13 gigajoules per ton hot metal produced. Can we provide alternatives at lower temperature and lower energy use, which might emit less CO2? The answer is yes, some progress has been made. For example, 
in the commercially available direct reduced iron route. Instead of coal, a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen is used as the reducing gas stream. This route promises lower energy and CO2 emissions than the traditional blast furnaces. You might imagine that we could do away with carbon entirely. Reducing iron ore with hydrogen yields water vapor instead of CO2. The carbon footprint of this process depends mainly on the CO2 emissions generated when originally sourcing the hydrogen. Another process that's CO2 free at the reactor is electrolysis. The thermodynamically uphill disproportionation of iron ore to its elements, iron metal and oxygen gas, is driven by an applied voltage. No external reducing agent is required. The oxide anions already present in the ore are the reducing agent. The CO2 footprint of this approach depends mainly on the CO2 intensity of the provided electricity. Other carbon-based options are being considered. For example, pig iron is currently made using charcoal in Brazil, and some steel mills are currently or have plans to be outfitted with carbon capture units. But can we move farther faster? What is the lower limit of energy and CO2 we can achieve to make iron from ore? To begin to answer this question, let's conduct a thought experiment. The thermodynamic minimum energy to produce iron from ore is simply the negative of the standard Gibbs free energy of formation of iron ore. And that's just 6.6 .6 gigajoules per ton iron at standard conditions. And if we require molten metal after this room temperature disproportionation, the thermodynamic minimum energy required to heat and melt the iron just up to its melting temperature, including the various phase changes of iron, brings us to a total of 8.6 gigajoules per ton iron, and no CO2 was created. Now, this thought experiment is meant to be just that, not to suggest that the thermodynamic minimum might be practically achievable, but to provocatively indicate that theoretically speaking, there's room to improve our processes and innovate CO2 emissions down to zero. So can we rethink how iron is produced? Can other reductants be proposed beyond those already being explored? The space of reducing agents is vast and includes gases, many inorganic compounds, hydrocarbons, including renewable and waste feedstocks, even metals. Reductants should be cheap and abundant enough to make a dent in the 80 megatons of steel made in the US. And ideally the byproduct would be non-toxic. Using the ore oxide anion itself may meet these criteria as long as zero emissions energy could be provided. This brings us to a second area of innovation. To provide the energy for this reaction, can new energy sources or carriers be used? Thus far, combustion chemical energy and electricity have been explored. But could many other forms of energy be employed, like induction heating, solar energy, mechanical energy, or waste heat? And for any combination of energy source or reductant, the following considerations might be helpful to think about. Can the heat or temperature requirement be dramatically lowered? Or can heat generating processes be coupled with heat consuming processes? And finally, can new chemistries drop into existing iron and steel infrastructure, including blast furnaces? Returning to our overview, next let's focus on the process of turning this liquid hot metal into steel stock. Steel is squeezed between rolls that impart tens of millions of newtons of force, so the rolls are driven by powerful electric motors. In current hot rolling processes, we use much more energy than the thermodynamic minimum deformation energy required. Why do we use so much energy? The steel slabs are rolled finer and finer multiple times, and size tolerances are checked at many stages. So that takes time, and much heat is lost to the environment and the skid, the conveyor belt, and has to be replenished along the way. So energy use in this process is about 84% for heating, primarily natural gas, with the remaining 15% or so being electricity for the motors and hydraulics. Can easily retrofitable technologies be used in these furnaces to recover heat or provide it with fewer emissions? Finally, returning to our process diagram, let's visit Mount Vesuvius, where steel stock becomes products. So we want to turn these steel sheets into a soup can. One rectangle we roll into a cylinder and seal it along the side. But how are the circular top and bottom prepared? Just like cutting cookies out of dough, circles are stamped out. Except we can't easily mash this leftover dough up for a third cookie or can lid. Instead, back to the steel mill it goes, getting recycled before it ever reached its tomato soup destiny. 
This example illustrates that fabrication typically uses subtractive manufacturing, cutting a part out of a whole. And the energy and CO2 consequences of fabrication and its scrap are significant. Not only are energy and carbon intensity high, but also the scrap that wasn't utilized represents material waste, whose energy can be quantified. So yes, fabrication scrap will get remelted and recycled, but we net dump about 0.1 quads in the US, making steel that we didn't use this time around. Can we decrease this material waste, increasing the utilization of stock? Some say yes. Emerging solutions are called near net shape processes, which create an intermediate stock much closer in geometry to the final product, therefore reducing downstream yield losses. Near net shape processes can be continuous casting for flat sheet steel products or starting from powder for more complex geometries. However, these powder-based processes are still under development. And one challenge is producing the same microstructure of the steel as the conventional processing route. This state of the art prompts new questions. Can we create technologies that allow us to increase material utilization of steel during fabrication while maintaining the desired steel material properties? Can clean cuts be achieved without the need for a sacrificial skeleton, allowing better component tessellation on the stock? Returning to the full journey from ore to can for context, we need superheroes, or better yet, humans with courage and the proper tools to drop in fresh technologies across the supply chain. And today I've outlined some technology challenges for each stage. One final area of technical interest is, can we reinvent the U.S. steelmaking value chain entirely? Can new low temperature processes convert ore directly to products, not having to go through traditional steel mills? Can near net shape parts be made not from stock, but from ore or metal powders via new additive manufacturing processes. We're also interested in solutions to other energy and emissions impactful challenges in iron and steel making, which we didn't cover today. One example would be low cost technologies that can remove copper from scrap in order to reduce the amount of virgin ore needed to combine with recycled scrap in order to meet composition specifications. And I leave you with several other considerations for any new process to read if you're interested. If you have breakthrough ideas in iron and steel making and fabrication, we'd love to hear from you. Please feel free to email us or fill out the teaming partner forms on our website. References are on the next slides, and I wish you the very best in your energy innovation work. <laughs>